Well, welcome to UX and Data. Uh, you're going to hear from Michelle Glazer. She's an analytics leader who has built the analytics team and culture at WW. She's an, uh, she's an epidemiologist turned analyst who has a passion for numbers that enables her to effectively build and drive global analytics strategies at WW. Please welcome Michelle. Thank you, Kim. Thank you for having me. Um, and thank you all for coming and listening. Um, so we all talk and we all hear and you, as you're at your companies, everybody sort of talks about data and how important data is. And I bet you've all were in a meeting, if not today, at some point in the last week and someone said, yeah, but I really love data or I'm really data driven. And that's great, but a lot goes in to getting from you know, saying that you're data driven to all of the steps that it takes to actually get there. So over the next you know, few minutes, 30 minutes or so, I will talk a little bit about how we have uh, built an analytics practice at WW. And I want to leave plenty of time for questions because I'm sure you all have questions that are more specific to your areas. And I'm happy to stay and talk and chat about all of them. But to start, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey. Um, and I think, you know, when you're in college or grad school, everybody thinks that your journey is going to be this linear path where you go to college and you go to grad school and then you get your good job right out of there and you're very excited and it's going to lead you to all of these other jobs. And I used to sort of talk about how my journey was unique because it looks more like this. And the more I've had that conversation and the more I've talked to people, everybody's journey is like this. At some point, you take a different path. At some point, you take a turn, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's life changing, and you sort of continue on your journey. My journey started um, as um, I was, had a, got a master's in public health in epidemiology. First, I had to learn how to spell epidemiology before I could actually do that. Um, but I focused in biostatistics, which I didn't realize was something that was going to set me on the course for you know, this career that I'm in now. Uh, I moved to New York as part of a CDC fellowship. I worked at the Department of Health. Things I worked on, um, I did a lot of injury work, so fi figuring out how and where people in New York City were getting injured. It also happened to be the time of the H1N1 outbreak, so I got thrown in. I was free labor for them, so I was working nine to nine, seven days a week. Uh, you know, that's what you do when you're in a fellowship. Uh, but it was amazing, and I loved it. And I was like, this is great. I'm an epidemiologist. I moved on to the fire department where I did the World Trade Center uh, health studies. Uh, I know in the news, again, um, a lot of the research we did, uh, writing research papers, you know, getting published, going to conferences. And again, I thought I was still on this linear path. And then I felt a shift and a change. And I said, I need something new. I want something new. And I happened to meet someone who would later become my very good friend and mentor uh, on a bike ride. I'm a triathlete um, and literally I was talking to a friend and I said, hey, I'm just looking for something new and he overheard and said, what do you do? I guess I said enough math words that made his ears perk up. Uh, he happened to work at Shutterstock. Uh, we connected and he said, well, you know SQL, you know stats, let's do this. Um, and he gave me a chance, he took a chance on me. And I took a chance on me, you know, and, and that's sort of what happens. Too often we sell ourselves short, uh, especially the women in the room. We tend to only apply for jobs when we have 100% of the qualifications. I didn't do that. I knew I did not have 100% of the qualifications. And I said, worst case, this doesn't work out. And I go back to public health. Except it did. And long, long story short, uh, I ended up at WW, and I'll talk about my journey sort of through the, the rest of the presentation of how I started at WW and how we have now built the analytics team, the practice, and have become this data-driven culture. So I'm going to start at the end, though. Uh, this slide is stolen from a colleague. Uh, I saw it in his presentation, and Field of Dreams is my favorite movie, so this will now be in every presentation I ever do. Um, but, you know, if I start from today, we've built out this practice, we've built out this data-first culture, and I say, I'll say we for everything, because even though I'm talking and I've done certain things, it's really been this team effort. Now, though, the requests are rolling in, um, the, me trying to hire enough to keep up with it, 
We're bringing in uh, more and more data engineers and analysts. Uh, I have more and more teams reaching out saying, hey, how can we work with you? So if you do this, everybody's going to come. So we've been, I've been at WW since uh, late 2016. So this hasn't been like a 10 or 20 year journey at WW. It's been two and a half years. Lots happened before I was there that set up for me being able to come in at the right time, be in the right place to do the things that we've done. In 2016, we had a couple of analysts working very separately. In 2017, sort of grouped the couple of analysts we had and really was primarily working with our product team. I sat in product when I was first hired. In 2018, last year, we started really working across the whole organization. Uh, we actually also switched teams. So now we sit on our global brands team. And it's almost irrelevant uh, because what we do is not team, we're, we're agnostic, we work with all of the different teams. And now that we're halfway through uh, 2019, which is sort of mind blowing, we are continuing to grow the team. Uh, we're working with more and more uh, different teams throughout the organization. Uh, we're a global, global company, so we work across uh, globally. And as I said, we're hiring. I may or may not mention that a couple more times. Uh, so the, uh, we have many markets throughout the world. Every one of our analyses covers all of these markets. So whether we're segmenting or filtering or doing just a global analysis saying this is happening globally, when I say global, I mean these markets. And from an accomplishment perspective as well, there's been an organizational shift. So what we used to talk about when we would talk about, you know, I have a KPI, it used to be, you know, signups or revenue or retention. And now I've built out this KPI Academy process that I'll go into in uh, more detail that's taught people how to create KPIs that are lead them to success, that are achievable, and allow them to test, learn, and iterate very quickly. Because that's really the goal. You know, you don't want to do something and say, you know, set it, forget it, and 11 months later, turn around and see what happens. That doesn't allow you guys to actually do your jobs and be successful. We've had global dashboard adoption. We've integrated with a tool called Looker, uh, who was just acquired by Google. So they were just in the news. Um, and we've built out dashboards and key dashboards that we know the company needs. And I have over 300 people using Looker. Uh, we also uh, brought in Google Analytics. I have about 350 people using Google Analytics. And again, all of our data globally are in these tools. We're starting to create a data democracy, and we'll go into all of this in more detail. Uh, but data is the center of a lot of what we do, and we think when new features are released, well, where's the data going? How are we analyzing it? What are the KPIs? And we're building this holistic data infrastructure. We work very closely with our data engineering team. They're the ones that have built this infrastructure that builds sort of the place that we go to get the data and analyze things. Um, and without them and the parallel path that they've been on building out our data infrastructure, we couldn't do what we do. So it's not just the analytics team looking at data at WW. Uh, you know, we're very quantitative. So I'll take you through, there's four teams that are what we consider research or intelligence at WW. From, um, in this slide, uh, we look from, it's in order of technical. So our experience research team, is on our product team. They typically advocate for what our members need, and they try to inform product design. So they're talking to our members, uh, very qualitative type of analyses. We have a human truths team. They want to find the attitudes, the perceptions, the intentions of our members. It's to inform the brand. The analytics team, we're discovering, we're interpreting, we're communicating data, we're trying to drive business decisions. And then we have our most technical team, and that's our data science team. They're actually building out data products, so they're not just doing a machine learning model. Let's see how many buzzwords I can use in one sentence. But they're building out these models, they're creating APIs that will allow our product team or our app to actually integrate and then automatically serve up data to our members that they need to see. But in terms of questions that we're all answering, the order becomes different. The analytics team is answering what happened how did our members do? What did they do? How did they get from one place to another? 
our experienced research team is saying, but what was the member's intent? Why did they choose that path? Our human truths team is saying, well, but why did that trend or that behavior occur? So if we see a change in food tracking or if we see a change in activity tracking, why, what's going on? What's either going on with our members or in the greater world that's led to that? And then our data science team is saying, what's next? And then how can we use the data in the product? So the order sort of switches a little bit. All right, so I said I'd start at the end. Now we're gonna go back to the beginning. So when I started back in 2016, I came in and uh, I asked for access to data. And the first question I got was, well, which, which data? And I said, what do you mean which data? And they said, well, we have you know, the data that's in this place and the data that's in that place and the data that's in this other place. And then all of the finance data and that's separate. And I was like, well, I don't really know, <laughs> which was my exact answer. Um, and then we had our front end data, which was in Omniture at the time. And that was also separate and only used by a couple of people that were creating these reports, downloading all of the data into Excel. Everything was very separate. And now we have a data lake. So that was this sort of parallel path that has happened over time as we've built out the analytics team and the analytics process, we've also had a team, several teams, building out our data infrastructure. So all of our data from all of those different places, from our studios, which is our in-person experience, to our app, to our Google Analytics data, we've switched to Google Analytics, to our website, to other third parties, our surveys, any type of data we, we collect, all goes into the lake. Now, it's not all rainbows and butterflies. When data's in the lake, it doesn't mean that we can use it and it's magic. But what it does mean is that the analytics team, the data science team, our other engineering teams can now access the data and use the data. And it takes all of that munging and work. And then our users, our end users, our, you know, our business partners, uh, Looker lays on top of the data lake so we can create all of our dashboards creates resiliency in the team when you have a dashboard that updates automatically. And then decks and presentations and ad hoc analyses, it's all become much easier because you don't have to download data from here and download data from there and know that our front end data doesn't actually match with our back end data. All of it now we know from our website to our app to our studio, we can follow our members across. And they're giving us incredibly personal information that we want to be able to leverage and help them be successful. So, lots of data. What is this data? And it's actually taken a long time for me to put this slide together. It feels really simple, but if I really drill down all of the types of data that we have, and you know, I encourage all of you to go back to your companies and think about it. What are sort of those categories of data that you have, and what questions does that help you answer? So we have demographic table data. Who are our members? Who are our prospects or our future members? What's their membership look like? So when are they signing up? When are they canceling? For how long are they members? For how long are they not members? The behavioral data, and that's where my team really digs in. And we look at all of this, um, but I'd say that we're now pretty expert at this behavioral stuff. What are people doing? How often are they doing it? How are they getting from point A to point B? A lot of our teams are using that to then update uh, different paths or apps or screens. And to that end, the pathing, how are they getting to an action? So let's say we expect someone to go into our app and track food a certain way. We can actually say they are tracking food that way or they're not and work with our design and our product teams to help them understand the behaviors of our members. And then that experience data, so that data the Human Truths team is collecting. That's a lot of survey data that's also feeding into our lake. So we can start getting that why, and that why our members are doing things or acting certain ways, and connecting it to the what. What are they doing? And overall, it ends up looking like this. So we have all of this data, and the goal is to bring it all together. You don't just want one source feeding your KPIs or your insights. You want to use all of it. It gives you that holistic view. I feel like there's lots of pictures. Good? Okay, so that was the data. And again, we've had an incredible data team that's been doing a lot of work. We've been partnering really closely with them. Uh, we share what our requests are. 
we share, um, I have a weekly meeting with them to talk about priorities and to say, hey, I, I'm getting a lot of these requests in, you know, can we work on the data to make it a little bit easier or structure the data in a way that'll be more helpful for the analysts. So we started with two analysts. One of, the, one of the analysts looked at Omniture data, and one of the analysts looks at behavioral data. And usually when I talk about this, I say one analyst and one analyst. They were actually also in separate places, separated by nine hours of time zones. One is in the West Coast, one is in the UK. Uh, they are both still on the team and wonderful, um, they, but they work separately. Uh, they rarely talk to each other. All of their analyses were pretty separate, and all of their results were only shared with the person asking the question. So things were very siloed. So you know, I talked about data silos. We also had analytics silos. Now we have a global analytics team with each analyst uh, dedicated to a specific business area. So we have a number of analysts dedicated to our different product teams. We have a number of product teams. We have a couple of analysts dedicated to marketing. Uh, we work with our finance teams, and we have a science team, which uh, we're a science-led, science-driven company. And so we're doing a lot of research studies. It goes back to my public health days where we're creating statistical plans, and we work with our science team a lot on some publications as well. But that was all, you know, rosy. How, how did we get there? Um, it wasn't easy. So when I first started, uh, I was hired, and I think my boss described it as, I'm not 100% sure what you're going to do, but we know we need something. And I said, cool. Um, I like data. I like health. I'm in. Why I said yes, I still don't 100% know, but I'm super happy I did. Uh, and we actually started and we brought in a tool called Action IQ, which is a CDP. And we were using it to connect all of our disparate data sources with our Salesforce implementation so we could email people and segment them differently. And that's when I said, cool, all right, I need to access some data. How do I do that? Long, long story there short is um, that became a huge project. We're still using it today. And I sort of started seeing the future. And I went to my boss and I said, hey, I feel like this is great and all, but we need to combine things. We need a team. We need to start thinking about this in a different way. And he said, write it up, put it together, put a deck together, which I did. Uh, if you ever Google like how to create an analytics team, which is pretty much what I did, um, you get all of these like charts and graphs that show you different types of analytics teams and the different types of data and how you know the data leads to wisdom and all of that stuff. All of that was in my decks. I went around and I presented it to executives and I got a lot of, yeah, you're right, but not yet. Or yeah, you know, that's interesting, but I don't see that for here. And getting those no's was really hard. You know, you, you walk in and you know you're right. You know this is something you need. And then you have a bunch of executives say, yeah, I don't know, doesn't, doesn't really sound right, doesn't resonate. Change the deck, did it again, change the deck, did it again, same thing. So I thought, well, I still know that we need something. We need more than just me and these, you know, these analysts that are, are looking at data in very different ways. What can we do? So I had this Action IQ project that was growing, and I said to my boss, hey, can I hire someone to help me on this? And he helped me uh, you know, put in that request and you know, get this person in that helps. And all of a sudden, I was like, well, this is great. And I started mentoring and ultimately managing the other two analysts. So instead of that sort of big approach of, I'm going to create this team and hire 10 people and you know, get the executives on board that way, it actually ended up being that almost product development cycle of really small changes over time that led to the big thing. And we started with the biggest need. So at the moment, the biggest need was this Action IQ project. And then I went to the next biggest need, which turned out we moved from Omniture to Google Analytics, and then I needed someone to start analyzing all of that Google Analytics data. We then built a process for requests, because as soon as I had data and I had people and people started seeing things happen, they were like, well, I have questions. How do I, how do I answer them? So we, our tech team already had a process for requests, so we weren't going to reinvent the wheel. So built out a process using JIRA, brought in some additional analytics tools, Google Analytics and Looker, 
And then I had to build up excitement. So we had a couple of really good analyses that went out there. We, uh, last year, uh, launched a new food program, Freestyle, and our team, my team did the work on showing that our members lost more weight on Freestyle than they had in the past. It showed up in commercials. It was very exciting, and it was a big win for the team, because all of these other teams all of a sudden saw, oh, hey, they can do all of this cool stuff. How do we get more? And we're continuing to innovate. I have contests going right now for different teams to use Looker, because it's our dashboarding tool. I need people to use it. But they're not used to it yet. So every week, I have a Looker user of the week. Monthly, I have a Looker user of the month. Next month, I'm going to give someone a bottle of wine, as long as they're local. I can't ship wine to Europe. Um, to, to get them excited. So it, it's all of these little things that continue to add up. And we're collaborating with teams across the organization. I get emails daily now from different teams that come to me and say, hey, can we work together? And the answer is always yes. Even if you don't have the bandwidth, even if you don't have the um, analysts available at the moment, as you're building the team and as you're building the practice, your answer is always yes. You'll figure it out. Whether I roll up my sleeves and I do something, which now the team sometimes laughs at, or you know, I pull an analyst that I know maybe is in a lull, or we come up with a plan to say, you know, over the next three or six months, we're going to do something. Whatever it is, making every team feel included and listened to and heard is the way that this ends up working. And that has led all of that, the data lake, the hiring of analysts, the team is now about to be nine. I have a new hire starting in two weeks. We're hoping to be 11 in the next couple of months. Again, if you're an analyst or know of one, send them my way. Um, it's all led to a real shift in how we approach data. So I like starting here because a lot of organizations, and I'm sure you're sitting there being like, man, you know, I wish I knew certain things. Well, you're not alone. A third of business leaders make decisions with data they don't trust. I was reading an article today that said that actually bad data is estimated to lead to $3 trillion in mistakes. It's trillion. And it's a fixable problem. And it's not a short-term problem. There's actually a really good Medium article that inspired me a few years ago um, when I was sort of first starting on this journey. It's very, very long, but it's about Wish.com and how they've sort of built this. And we've taken a very similar path. And in the article, it said, this will not be a short process. It's three years. And we're, we're in year two-ish. And they were right. Like, now I see, I see it. It's working. We're moving. Things are happening. But we all started here. Where we're and now, we're starting to make data-driven decisions. I sat in a meeting today where all we did was review the Looker dashboard. And the entire team, we were just going through the Looker dashboard, they were asking questions, and we were filtering as we went. And decisions were made, and actions were taken because of the conversation we had. And I just looked around the room, and I was like, this is the best meeting I've ever been to, because it's working. Um, we have global Google Analytics adoption. Uh, I had a, there's actually an app which I knew about, but I haven't really used the Google Analytics app. And I had our head of finance email me yesterday with a screenshot of the app. And he said, hey, I have a question about this data. And I was like, oh, I have to log into, you know, I had to like log into the app and see what he did and match. But that's one of the heads of finance at a billion dollar company emailing me about questions about Google Analytics data. To me, that's a pretty big success. We have really nice collaboration between the analysts and their teams. And it all works differently. So I had, I built out, and again, you just have to keep learning from what happens. So when I first built out this process, I wrote up like an 11 page document that outlined in very big detail, very minute detail, what this process was gonna be and how all of this analytics was going to work. It has now been distilled down to a one pager that people actually read. And each analyst works with their teams differently. So I have one analyst who meets with one of our heads of uh, directors of product uh, on a weekly basis where they review the priorities because she works with about five product teams. So they'll, they'll review all of the tickets, they'll review the priorities, 
and they'll figure out what's most important for this week. I have another analyst who has a every other week meeting with all of her product managers, and she just says, hey, you guys, you submitted 15 tickets in the last two weeks. Let's all talk it out about how we can prioritize these tickets. So what works for one team won't always work for another team, but as long as each analyst feels that they can be fulfilled and they can know what they're doing and they can know what their priorities are, that's the important part. And we've done KPI Academy, which I'll go into in more detail right now. Uh, this is actually one of the, my favorite inventions, so to speak. Um, I saw sort of a problem where I'd sit in a lot of meetings and everybody, and it, you know, it's, would say, oh, my KPI is retention, um, which is, you know, the amount, we're a subscription-based business, so the amount of time someone stays on the program, but if you, you know, see our earnings calls, it's 10 months long. And so my question was, are you gonna wait 10 months to see your answers? Or are you gonna wait 10 months to see if you've changed something? Um, or, you know, KPIs being revenue. A lot of times that's pretty hard to measure. Or it's not something that, especially as a public company, revenue isn't something that we're going to share particularly widely. So how do I teach the teams that it's not that they're wrong, they're certainly not wrong, those are important metrics, but how do we build metrics that make more sense for them? I started with the product teams, and then I've moved it out, I've done this with the marketing teams, some finance teams, I did it with, um, we have an office in uh, Toronto, and I, I, wa I walked into a Zoom, and I saw a table completely full of people, and I was actually more nervous for that than I was for this, because Somehow feeling people on Zoom just looking at you is much more nerve-wracking than the interaction of this. But they've all been through the academy and now I see it starting to work. And what we talk about, it's a 90-minute program where I go through all of this and then I actually have it be interactive. And I have people think and I tell them, I start and say, be selfish. Only think about yourself and your work. Don't exit your sandbox and we're gonna come up with your KPIs in the next 90 minutes. And it works, and you know, it's, it's not just 90 minutes and I'm never speaking to you again, but it's 90 minutes and we've made some progress. So we start with leading measures, which are typically inputs, which can be impacted, and are typically the subject of A-B tests. Uh, so if you think about um, in our business, if I look at our visitor site, which is the site where people sign up to become a member, all of the steps along the way to that sign up, when you hit that confirmation page and someone is paid, those are all leading measures. Every step along the way, every drop off point, those are percentages of people who did one thing and went to the other, and that becomes a leading measure. Our lagging measures are our outputs. So these, that's sign ups, that's that conversion. They're harder to influence though, because by the time you measure it, it already happened. Weight loss. So we are a wellness company, but for those people who choose that they want to lose weight, that outcome of weight loss, all of the things that you've done, all of the food that you've tracked, all of the activity that you've done, it's already happened, so it's too late. So how do you incrementally measure the things along the way? And then the North Star, and this is where your brain always goes first. When you think about a KBI, your brain will always go to the North Star first because it's organization-wide, it's very strategic, it's revenue, it's signups, but it's super hard to change quickly. So in order for you to test something, in order for you to launch something, you want those iterative leading and lagging measures along the way. Um, I do, before I go to what it looks like in action, um, I just wanna take a minute or two and talk about, as I've built the team, as I've hired the team, I just wanted to touch a couple of minutes on how I've hired. Hiring's hard, um, and for anybody in this room that has tried to hire before, um, we've all made mistakes, we've all brought people in for interviews, and then you sit around a table of people telling you feedback, and they're like, that was the worst thing you ever could have done to us, or why did you waste our time? And we definitely work in an open feedback culture where people feel free to tell you uh, in a nice way and respectful way, but what they really think. Um, and I've learned a lot along the way, and it gets harder as you go, because now that the team is nine, they all actually like each other. Uh, they have this 
inside joke with each other where they're hiding a piece of paper that has some weird picture on people's, it's all, it's all very inside jokey, which is awesome, except it makes it really hard to bring new people in because I don't want to disrupt the culture. I don't want to change what's, what's going on. So as I'm hiring, I'm looking for that mix of technical skills, of soft skills, um, of being able to communicate. I have them come in and meet with the, at least one or two analysts, the teams that they'll work with. It's a pretty involved hiring process. I have them take a SQL test that's on paper. So they basically have to look at a schema and answer some questions. Uh, my mentor uh, who hired me in my first tech job, uh, he's the one who said, don't have them do a real test where they're like able to look at the data. He was like, you'll get an understanding having them look at a schema and fill out some SQL, write out some SQL code. And I actually learn more about a person based on that SQL test than almost anything else. I can see how they problem solve. I can see how they approach things. I can see how they try to solve a problem when they don't know an answer. I actually hired the person who told me that one of my questions in my SQL test, he told me one of the questions was wrong. He then told me why he believed it was wrong. He then told me what the right way to answer, ask and answer the question would be, and then he solved the problem in the way he thought was correct. I wanted to hire him on the spot. So, you know, it, it goes a long way to understand how people solve problems. But what this looks like in action, we do a lot of website A-B testing. So uh, really what we're trying to do ultimately is measure changes in conversion rate on our website. But we're looking at that optimal conversion path. So if we go for our leading measures and our lagging measures, our leading are the percentage of people going from each step, and our lagging measures are conversion rates. So here's an example. The photo um, with the egg is a recipe page. So it's a page that our social media will send people to, an email will send people to, and pe uh, we get a lot of traffic to recipes. We're formerly Weight Watchers. You know, we get a lot of recipe traffic. Uh, and so, but once someone lands on a recipe, what do they do next? What percentage of them convert? What percentage of them go to this page that shows them the different plans? And so we do a lot of work working with the different teams to understand those paths and those percentages, and then ultimately what leads to conversions. The app behavior, so we have an app. What behaviors lead to success? What does success look like? How do our members build those healthy habits? So this is um, a series of graphs that we actually published uh, last year after we launched our new food program that showed the percentage of people tracking food. And we saw that when we told people that they had more sort of free foods that they didn't need to track, they actually tracked food more. So we looked at the percentage of people over the course of several years tracking food, and we saw that they were tracking food more. This has led to one of the analysts now almost solely focusing on the search and tracking experience within our app and how people go from clicking on the search bar to typing in what they want to look for. So pizza that we ate this evening, typing in pizza, finding the right pizza, so whether it was cheese or pepperoni or whatever it may have been, and then the percentage of people who actually go on to track that. Whole project. We also have a members only social media platform called Connect. And so we have an analyst dedicated to this whole Connect space and answers questions such as, how does our members interact on Connect? Who gets likes? Who gets comments? Does that lead to better weight loss success? Does that lead to people staying longer? Do they build relationships? What does a relationship look like on social media? It's actually a place without trolls, which is pretty impressive. So what does that mean? What are the top hashtags? They just, we just created a, a groups product, as many of the social media companies are doing these days. And a lot of these groups were formed from some of those analyses that showed the top hashtags. Our top hashtags typically have nothing to do with weight loss. They're non-scale victories, or NSV. They're recipes. Um, not in this um, thing, they're WW bros. So the men of WW, new moms. All of those have now become groups. And that's from some of the analytics that the team did. And then studio. So it's um, our in real life experience where you walk, into a, you walk into a place like this and you have a meeting and you sit down or a workshop 
and you sign in, maybe you weigh in, maybe you buy something. We actually collect all of that data, and we now can have an understanding of how that in-person experience correlates with the digital experience. We have a rewards program that actually rewards people for doing the behaviors we want. And so you get these wins if you attend a workshop. And so we look at how many of our people, members, that attend workshops actually go in and look for wins. And then how many of them redeem their wins? And there's cool stuff up there. I put the Rent the Runway thing up there because that's what I'm using my wins for when I get enough wins to get Rent the Runway. Um, it's my reminder. But, and then what are the optimal attendance patterns for our members? How does it all work? How does it all correlate? What happens when they miss a week? They probably went on vacation. Did they come back the next week? Lots of good questions that we're constantly answering. And then the most important thing we do is work with the teams to tell them how to use it. You can have an analyst that sits in a corner all day and finds cool things, looks for the data, looks through the data, finds awesome insights. If you don't then take that step and work with the team that can actually make the changes, they may have well have taken a nap in the corner. The data isn't anything without people to act on it and use it. So if there's like one thing you remember that I say today, it's that whenever you're working with an analytics team, you're building an analytics team, you're trying to use data or look at data, it has to be usable. It has to be informative. It has to lead to something. Otherwise, you know, think to yourself, why do I need it? And so just the list of places, teams, people we work with. And that's it. So love to answer your questions. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. I learned a lot. Uh, a question I have is, um, what do you do if you have a difference with the experienced people who do qualitative research? They have different findings. Qualitative finding with your quantitative finding, what do you do? It's a really good question. So, um, and it's a really interesting question, right? So if the qualitative findings say one thing, like members want to do the certain path, and we're seeing quantitatively that something else is happening, we actually will sit down and we'll talk about it. Sometimes it means maybe there's a bug in the way that they think that it's happening. Sometimes we'll actually ask them and say, hey, can you go back and watch people do it both ways and see what happens? Um, sometimes we're occasionally wrong. Um, but usually it means that more questions have to be asked. So if, and it goes sort of with any data, if any data is ever in conflict, it means you have to ask more questions, dig deeper, then you have to figure out why. And once you know the why, you can understand why those data are in conflict. <laughs> yeah, remarkable work, Michelle. It's very, very um, uh, informative here. And I think also Weight Watchers were now WW is a it's a fascinating company. A friend of mine used to work there um, maybe six, seven years ago. So I had a little bit of understanding, but that was pre-Oprah's investment. And it was that time it was, I think it was in complete disarray. And it's very exciting to see the company now with new leadership, the current CEO, she seems to be awesome. And um, people like you building this data-driven culture. And I know that Wall Street is beating down the company down and say, well, the number of new recruits has not been increasing. What's happening? But I think, you know, but I also look at this it, like, you guys have such rich data. You have a really strong, very loyal community for the people who actually sign up, right? So it's interesting. It's like, I wonder how you think about strategically what the company should really leverage the rich data with the existing customers and translate that into solving, kind of helping the company to solve the new recruit challenge that is currently facing. So how do you approach that from, from your seat, thinking about it from your analytics team, and then how solving that challenge will need to, how your team need to change or, or evolve to in, in order to address that challenge for the company like better? Perils of working for a public company. Everybody always knows how your company is doing. But it's actually a great thing. 
Uh, so I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, we need to be using this data to drive the decisions to, um, I mean, I wouldn't say turn us around because I think, you know, things, things are, are amazing, um, but to sort of help that gap that Wall Street has, has uh, talked about. So I think some of it is we're just scratching the surface. You know, we've now, we're two, two-ish years into this process of building out this team, building out our data infrastructure. Now it's time to really start leveraging, to start using, to start, the meeting I was sitting in today was actually looking at our sign-up numbers and looking at the different percentages of people going from one step to another step and another step. And what channels were they coming in on? And it was so fun because I had people from marketing and finance and product all sort of working together to say, great, now that we know that this is happening, we're going to use it. And I think three or four A-B tests were decided on in that meeting alone. So I think those are the types of things we want to be doing with our data, leading to more tests, leading to more feature development to help continue to drive that process better. Other questions? Hey, Michelle, thank, thank you so much for the presentation. And that, that's just so cool how you built this all like from, from the ground up, you know, just kind of this, uh, this castle out of, the, out of the sky. I don't know, just like so much, so much imagination. And, uh, it was really cool. Um, so I'm very curious about how, how technical the, the behavioral uh, truths part was, uh, how, much, how much technical stuff that they do versus or if there's any sort of uh, social science stuff that they're doing or any, anything else that's not so technical. Because you said that there's a lot of analytics in pretty much every different team. Um, so so, so how, how technical is the work that they're doing specifically? Yeah, so um, if I go back to that, those four teams, our um, experience research team is uh, doing very qualitative, they're doing a lot of interview work. So one-on-one, -on -one, um, user experience type of interview work. Our human truths team, uh, they're creating surveys. So um, I think a little bit more in that social science arena that you were just speaking to. Uh, lots of surveys, surveys that go out to a lot more people. Um, and then they're using some of the survey tools to help analyze the data. The neat thing is, is now we're also getting that data into our data lake for the analysts and the data scientists who can write SQL, um, Python, some other you know, things, uh, R, uh, I think I've just covered a lot of the technical things that we do, um, can analyze it in a different way. So, oh, okay. so, so they're doing more of the survey stuff, and then the other people are coming in and doing more of the like, te technical and programming yeah, exactly. aspects. Okay, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about the KPI Academy. Um, I'm here with two of my colleagues, and we've kind of like gone through this process of trying to establish a sort of what we call it office hours of like teaching people more about analytics. And with our experience, it's just been the interest just doesn't seem to be there. So I'd, I'd like to like hear a little bit more about um, how you went about establishing the KPI Academy and how you actually get people like interested and excited in attending, um, attending that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, one, I set up meetings and I forced people to attend. I actually traveled to our office in San Francisco and made everybody attend. I said, I told them all, I was like, I am here specifically for these meetings. So I actually set up these small groups, 90 minute sessions, um, where I had, it was within their team, so I didn't have other teams. And then I started it and I said, okay, this is the only meeting that you're ever gonna hear me say this. Be selfish for the entire meeting. And when people can go into a meeting and really just focus on what they need and what sort of their problems are, it went a long way to getting them on board. Now, not every team was super excited about this. Um, and so through these KPI academies, I was able to find the teams that were going to be my sort of early adopters. And then after the first round, I think I did 20 of them. Um, after that first round, I went back to those teams that were more excited and particularly excited. And I got them to you know, start using our Looker dashboards. I got them to start sort of putting it in their presentations. I saw in a presentation the other day, leading and lagging measures, and I threw a party. I like interrupted the meeting, and I was excited about it. Uh, so it's also sort of continuing to reinforce it, continuing to talk about it, uh, working with the different teams. You know, pick an area. Don't you know? Don't take the whole company. Pick one area and get them excited. Um, you know, with Looker, we've been running contests. Gamify it. Uh, if if you sort of appeal to people's competitive nature or their you know, problem they're trying to solve, or if it's a finance team, 
telling them how much money they can save. You know, know which team you're working with and, you know, sort of appeal to what you know uh, will we'll get them. And then be relentless. Follow up, keep talking about it, keep integrating it. It's going to be on you, but they'll come around. Hi. Uh, I thank you for your presentation. Uh, I looked at your LinkedIn earlier today, and it mentioned sort of an analytics excellence sort of training program. I work for a global company, and all of our data people are in Sweden, except for me. Uh, and so one of the things that I've been looking to do is how to upskill the people around me so that I can get more work done. I was wondering if you could share a little bit of how you went about that process and what that kind of looks like for you. So upskilling the analysts? Upsc yeah, yeah, like upskilling uh, internal employees, like in SQL, Looker, Python, et cetera. Yeah, so for the analyst team, uh, as, I, as I was hiring them, uh, for the team itself, last year I actually ran SQL Club which was super fun. Um, everybody at least had basic knowledge of SQL. Yeah, I'm super nerd. Uh, but you know, you have to be in, in our world. Uh, SQL Club started at the beginning of last year and where I would give pretty simple challenges to the team because I also needed to get a sense of where everybody's SQL skills were. And we would come together every week. I'd give a challenge. A week later, we'd talk about the challenge. We'd review the code. And then we'd sort of, I'd give another challenge. Uh, and the skills grew pretty quickly. And by the end of last year, they were reviewing really complex, we were using that time to review complex code with each other. Oh, well, there it goes. Uh, to review complex code with each other. Uh, so that was the analyst team. I think for the, some of the non-technical teams, to get them excited about data, they're not necessarily going to want to dive in and start writing SQL. I think some of our dashboards have been super helpful to get people to interact with data. Uh, to learn how to look at data, to learn how to look at a chart and understand what's in it. Google Analytics has also been very helpful uh, because their front end, it's Google, and they've built this incredible front end that's allowed me to have people sort of go in and pull their own data. I've created like a 70 slide user's guide for Google Analytics that helps people along the way and know how to navigate and sort of do our specifics. Um, so, you know, from the, for the non-technical perspective, you definitely have to handhold a little bit more. I'm working on something similar for Looker right now of how do you filter, how do you request access, how if you need a different number, you know, you contact us, all of that type of stuff. And then for the more technical teams, analytics teams, or even people interested, some of your finance teams or people interested in SQL, you can do some sort of SQL club to build everybody up. Of course, there's tools and GA and all of that to General Assembly to, to get people trained. But I found that team aspect really helped. What type of analytics do you do around the customer journey and understanding? So when from the time someone expresses interest, what are their various steps? And what do they take advantage of in terms of your offerings, digital and other? And what are the interdependencies of the different digital channels? How does one influence the other? Or do you just look at them separately? So how does an offline relationship influence your usage of the app, and vice versa? More perspective on that. Yeah, so from a member's perspective, so once someone is, it's a sort of a constant question that we have is, you know, how do we understand our members at different points? So if you, if you all think about a weight loss journey, it's not, again, if you go back to that linear path I thought I was on career-wise, it's not linear. It's up, it's down, it's difficult, you have setbacks. So how do we then look at someone's data and understand, okay, well, you started and you started real strong and you've been tracking food every day and then maybe you stopped for a little while. What happened? Um, and so, you know, we only have the data we have, but we're able to look at the different behaviors of are you looking at recipes? Are you going into Connect? If you were a studio member, were you attending studios? Did your weight plateau? And we actually connect all of those different points and we do most of our analyses by what we call tenure, which is the amount of time someone has been a member. So to your journey point, it's we know at different points along that tenure or that journey, members are going to behave differently. And we look to that, um, you know, at which point are people tracking activity or syncing their device? so we can you know, automatically get their steps and their 
workouts or whatever, and how do we then integrate that? Is that correlated with food tracking? Is that correlated with tracking your weight? So we're doing a lot of those types of things on the member side. Similarly, on the acquisition side, um, when we look at different channels, people come in, when they come to the site, are they coming to the more top of funnel pages, such as articles or recipes, maybe uh, coming back multiple times? Maybe over the course of several months, are they coming back and then you know, coming to convert? Or are they going to a more bottom funnel page where it's a pricing page where they have the intent to sign up? And what behaviors and how are those behaviors different? Is that helpful? Yeah. Yeah. Saw more hands. Hi. Um, I just recently, I'm in a career transition, and I just recently completed the 10-week Python course here at General Assembly. And I've been working on my own, but I don't feel comfortable calling myself a data analyst on LinkedIn. And I'm looking for work. So how do I kind of make that transition to, or think as I'm working on my own and independently, to feeling comfortable saying, this is what I want to do. This, these are the steps that I'm taking to get there from someone who hires and from someone who kind of did it the same way, too. Thank you. Well, first, own it. Um, you know, you've gone through the class. You've acquired the skills. So you know it. Keep using it, because especially these types of skills, if you don't use it, you lose it. So take on projects. Keep sort of building, building your portfolio. And then, you know, I took a job at um, Shutterstock, a company I knew zero about photography, but someone, you know, took a chance on me, and I threw myself in. Um, one of my actual best friends now is someone who taught me, literally would sit down at lunch with me and teach me about photography. So look at different companies, expand your horizons. Um, you know, maybe it's not the perfect job or your dream job. Maybe it's a little bit more junior than you expected to be, but get in there, get that experience. And you know, as long as you're working hard and producing good results, people will see that and you'll be able to you know, keep growing. It's, it's about getting that sort of first, first in. Um, and you know, I'd be flexible about what that is because we all know this. Nothing is permanent, nothing is forever. It's, you know, as long as you're learning and growing, you can, you know, that's why I stay at companies, as long as I'm learning and I'm growing and I'm enjoying the work that I do. Um, and, you know, you can, you'll, you'll be able to do that. Hi, thank you very much, Michelle, for sharing um, the company culture and history. Uh, my name is Wendy, and it's been a great pressure listening to the transition um, and evolution of Weight Watchers, and it really, make me want to sign up for today as a member of it. <laughs> yeah, um, and I'm very interested in learning more about the transition from data silos to a data lake, especially like how do you manage such a large data pool? What analytic tools are you using? Like do you store in the cloud? And how do you share with other team members? Yeah, so very good question. Um, very complicated, so in my whatever 30 second response, it'll only scratch the surface, but all of our different engineering teams are actually sending data to the data lake, all on the cloud. Our data lake sits in the Google Cloud, so we're um, using Google BigQuery to access the data. Um, and so we write SQL directly there, or Looker sits on top of it, or other sort of programs can sit on top of it. Um, it's sort of a mix of how it gets there, and a lot of times when it gets there, it's either unstructured or it's difficult to analyze. So we have another, we have two different data engineering teams. We have a second data engineering team that actually transforms the data into something more usable for the analysts. So we work very closely with them, giving them some requirements, working through the data. They've created a lot of what we call star schema for us as well to use. So it's been a mix of either writing um, queries on the raw data that's directly in the data lake or using sort of this um, views on top of the data. But all in Google. Other questions? Hi. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I wanted to know if you had looked into um, other analytics platforms like Mixpanel and Optimizely, um, and if you were using them, and if you weren't, what were some of the criteria that you used to evaluate um, in choosing Google Analytics versus those? Yeah, so we do use Optimizely for our A-B testing, um, and actually we feed some of that Optimizely data into Google Analytics, so not only do we understand the test results, 
but we understand the paths and the behaviors that led to those test results. Um, when we were uh, evaluating, um, we were using Omniture, which was Adobe's platform. We wanted something with a tag manager and the front end sort of platform. Um, and we have uh, sort of billions of hits a month. Um, so we needed something pretty big when we were looking at different platforms and Google just stood out from the crowd. I also wanted something very front end easy. One of the Omniture uh, difficulties we had was a lot of people logged in and just got confused. And part of that was our fault in the way we set it up. It's definitely not all them. Um, but Google you know, was a pretty easy decision for us to make. Um, I, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to like how you got executive buy-in um, and how you maintained kind of your strategic vision of what you felt the analytics, your analytics team should be, um, especially, so you know, my colleagues and I, one of the challenges that we're also dealing with in trying to build out an analytics team is making sure that our analytics team is doing analytics and um, in a growing company where there's a lot of different needs, you want to be seen as a, a team that's cooperative, willing to work with others, but at the same time, you want to make sure you don't take on work that a growing company just needs someone to be able to handle it um, and that you stay aligned with kind of really growing out like your analytics vision. Um, so just kind of talking through that a little bit more would be great. Yeah, it's, it's a difficulty. Um, and it's been a mix, to be honest with you. We've taken on projects where, you know, later I've said, you know what, we took that on and we did the thing, but now it needs to transition to this team and here's why. And as long as you have the here's why and you get that team's buy-in, you know, you can do a lot with sort of that transition. Um, I think a lot of what we've done is... We've worked on some big projects, which has been helpful, um, but I also have said yes to a lot of teams just to get people excited. Uh, we were a little under the radar for a while, which was probably a good thing. It allowed me to build and make some mistakes and um, build out the team a little bit. We worked mostly with product, at least in 2017, uh, and I, product was in. Uh, so, you know, one approach is to again go one team at a time. Uh, it was actually advice I got when we were first implementing, advice I got and didn't follow uh, when we were first implementing Looker. And it, they said, go one team at a time. Stop trying to do it all. We would have moved faster had I done that. Um, but you know, if you get one team to buy in, the other teams will actually get jealous because they'll all of a sudden be able to start making all of these decisions and show up to a meeting with the numbers and say, well, but we know we need to do this because where the other teams don't have that. So I think that's a lot of what I've been trying to do. And um, at every company, and I'm sure you know who this is at your company, there's one or two people that if you get them to sort of buy in, you've won. Focus on them. All right, any other questions? Well, thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.